Hello, this is Solar PVTD from EU PVSEC 2016 from Munich. We are together with Paolo Frank, who is uh, head of the Renewable Energy Division at International Energy Agency. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. So, Paolo, can I start strong? Sure. So, do you believe in the clean disruption and do you believe that we can reach 100% of clean energies? And is it also considered in one, let's say, of the scenarios by the agency? Uh, it is not considered in, it has never been considered in any scenario of the International Energy Agency so far. Mm -hmm. uh, from our analysis, we could um, think technically possible to go 100% in renewable electricity. Mm -hmm. It would be harder in the heat and in the uh, transport sector, but from a technical point of view, I consider it feasible. From an economic point of view, I'm not sure this is the best solution. Uh, the IA is in favor of a well-balanced portfolio of renewables within a balanced portfolio of low-carbon technologies, which has to uh, never uh, forget that we also need to guarantee security, energy security, at an affordable price. So the combination, the challenge is enormous and we don't have the luxury to skip options. So for us, the solution is in a well-balanced portfolio of technologies of which renewables will certainly play a very important role. Okay, we started strong, now a bit softer. No but it was very interesting to, to listen to this point. So Paolo, uh, you started uh, around nine years ago at International um, Energy Agency. And uh, at that time, I suppose that maybe the interest of the agency in the renewables was not so, uh, so high. And I would like to ask you, how did it, uh, let's say, evolve during these years? Look, I, I, I will tell you an anecdote that explains you all. When, when I entered the IA, mm -hmm. indeed, I thought I would have to, how can I say, uh, put the helmet on and uh, fight every day. Mm -hmm. But in reality, I found a much very different and more positive uh, mm -hmm. environment in which there was a great interest to innovation and also a great interest in the clean technologies, even at that time. Oh. And the main reason is, never forget, the IA is an intergovernmental organization and we basically, the Secretariat does what our governments ask us to do. You represent? We represent the mostly, it's, it's almost the same countries than the OECD, so it's Europe plus North America, uh, plus uh, um, other countries, uh, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand. Now, in 2005, the G8 of Glen Eagles in the UK gave the mandate to the IA to develop climate change mitigation scenarios. And since then, our view and the role of renewables in all the scenarios on the IA have been constantly and massively improving. Of course, they improve over time when policy change and improve. Uh, we are sometimes uh, attacked of being conservative, we, our scenarios, I, I repeat what I said in some intervention, the IA does not do long-term forecasts. Mm -hmm. We do scenarios with- Flexible, very, yeah, with all the- with, with, policy, with very clear mm -hmm. policy assumption. If you do a certain policy of you have a certain measure, a certain carbon price, a certain kind of incentives for renewables or for other technologies, you will get there. Mm -hmm. And if you uh, don't, you will have another result. Ah, so we are making like a, uh, let's say, continuous assessment. We do, we have different scenarios. The World Energy Outlook has three scenarios. It has the current policies, so basically the current policies then are frozen. Mm -hmm. The new policies, which are policies that have been announced but not yet fully implemented. And then it has a 450 scenario, which is compatible with a concentration of 400 ppm, which is, should lead to a two degrees temperature increase in the long term. Mm -hmm. these, the assumptions for these scenarios are totally different and the results are totally different. Mm -hmm. So in the NPS scenario, uh, there is a limited uh, share 
of renewables in 450 degrees, uh, the 450 scenario, there are much more renewables. We did in another publication, which is the energy technology perspective and then the solar roadmap, we did the high renewable electricity variant with a high penetration of solar PV and wind, which uh, came to the conclusion that by 2050, solar electricity as a whole, so solar PV plus solar thermal electricity, could become the first source of electricity in the world. Yes, but maybe it will be even quicker. Maybe it will be even quicker, but this very much still depends on policies. The, the thing I said this morning, I repeat here, exactly. it's a very good thing that PV is becoming cheaper and cheaper. This does not automatically mean that it becomes competitive, in particular in a market design which was designed and developed in another, for other technologies with other objectives in mind. We need a rethinking of the remuneration schemes, we need more sophisticated energy markets, we need more sophisticated energy policies. This is the challenge. If these policies, including appropriate market design, are introduced, mm -hmm. it's true, it, it can could be quicker, quicker exactly. but if not, uh, it could be slower. So, I, um, I, in an intervention before, I said it is important that the PV sector, on one hand, realizes the enormous improvements that it has done. It's really a success story which has few similarities in the whole energy spectrum, the whole, eh? not just in renewables. And this should be a reason for being proud. Mm -hmm. On the same time, the sector should not tell itself only nice stories. There are barriers, there are enemies, there are people who think that are losing because of PV, yes, exactly. and one has to find exit. Exactly, this was the discussion. For, 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 for these uh, persons, I'm, I'm speaking about the impact of jobs mm -hmm. when you shut down coal, mining or coal power plants. And if this is not done in the right way, things can be more complicated. And we, I have to say, we see it now in Europe. PV had a record year mm -hmm. last year. Maybe 2016 will be another very good year, but not necessarily in Europe. In Europe, the annual additions are going down, and there is a need for better and enhanced policies to revamp the markets and to revamp the uh, sector here. And we heard it this morning very clearly from industry, without a strong domestic European market, it will be difficult for the European industry to remain strong in this continent. Of course, for the industry and for the research, yes. For the industry and the research, yes, but most likely the manufacturing capacities will go closer to the markets because you don't want to produce in one place and then and uh, exactly and then transport anywhere else. So um, this is why uh, for me it is important to give this ambivalent uh, message also around COP. COP was a historic milestone. It's the first time in history yes, okay. that so many countries agree on something which is so important now it has to be implemented and it has been accelerated, raising ambitions, so the big part of the work needs to be done. Renewables will play as a whole uh, a very crucial role, but don't make the mistake to think that policies are no longer needed. Policies are still needed for a different objective. In the past, it was to give financial incentives to cover the cost gap. Now it's not necessarily to cover this cost, to but to, write, barriers to remove barriers and to create the necessary framework to enable investment. Exactly. And I think it's so important you know, that uh, um, these words are said by you, who is representing the countries, and not by the solar lobbies, for example. I, I think we have the privilege not only to represent the, some countries, of course not the whole countries in the world, but a very important group of countries. And we have the privilege to look at the whole sector in its entirety. 
Uh, the other very crucial point is, with renewables becoming stronger and bigger, they it's like becoming adult. One has to take responsibility. Exactly. And for renewables, it will it means to take responsibility of the whole system, to make sure that the whole system uh, is correctly developed and that the value that renewables bring to the system are maximized. And it's not just a, a question of reducing cost, exactly. but of maximizing value, of producing electricity and energy where and when it is needed. Mm -hmm. So the integration of variable renewables like solar and wind becomes critically important and this is feasible again it's not a technical problem mm -hmm. at low shares it is also it has not economic impact unless you do some mistakes mm -hmm. but at the higher shares it requires a profound transformation so basically it's not about integrating a marginal amount of renewables into an existing system which was designed years and decades ago but to introduce the new system to introduce redesign. a redesign a system mm -hmm. which will have to be much more flexible. And uh, your division is helping the governments to understand that also? And the division is doing, uh, has been doing significant work on this grid integration issues now for 10 years. Mm -hmm. We have done several publications on grid integration and very recently, on the 1st of June, a unit, a special unit on system integration of renewables was created, giving the strong signal of how system integration has become important. Integration, more flexibility means four things. Grids and interconnections. The more you have better interconnections and wider balancing areas, the smoother the balancing of variable renewables become. Mm -hmm. Second, to use also other dispatchable supply. I'm thinking about hydro, I'm thinking about bioenergy, but also gas. Mm -hmm. uh, use storage whenever this is affordable. And now we're looking very carefully at the progress of batteries. This is very interesting, but don't forget pumped hydro. Mm -hmm. The pumped hydro remains the largest, poten the largest amount of electricity storage today and has still a big potential. And fourth, last but not least, demand-side management. Mm -hmm. So to shift demand instead of supply, in many cases, this is the cheapest option that you can have to integrate variable renewables, but it is hardly exploited because the market is, with few exceptions, the market is not really there. Mm -hmm. So there is a big, big work to be done to achieve the long-term targets of COP21 and Paris and to uh, achieve the aspiration, as you said, that PV could go even quicker than we think. It is possible because it's a really, it's um, a technology which is today okay. reliable and already very uh, interesting from an economic point of view, but we know that it has still an enormous improvement potential we heard this morning. Hopefully. Uh, oh, I, this will come. And in that, I remember to be a semiconductor physicist and to know how much progress can still be done. But this will only happen if we have the right market, the right policies. And don't forget one aspect. Um, it's very good and that cost <clears throat> have been reduced so massively so that people realize that PV is at comparable prices than fossil fuels. On the other hand, the industry still needs to make some profit mm -hmm. and to make the necessary investments to scale up manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So it has to be the financing aspect needs to be taken into account by the policymakers in order for this growth, for this sector to have a sustainable long term growth, which is needed. Otherwise, we will not have exactly. the um, aspirational, asp aspired um, PV market. Uh, Paolo, and another question. Uh, what about your cooperation also with electric cars, uh, let's say division? Do you have also division uh, at uh, the agency? Or how do you see, because today we are not speaking only about energy, actually. We are speaking about the energy and transportation solution. It is related also to the energy storage, etc. 
and uh, do you have all already some kind of cooperation within the agency? Do you work together? Sure, sure, we do. The electric cars are uh, be dealt with by a transport unit, which is another uh, part of the agency, but we have strong collaboration with them and we look at all kinds of transportations, including electric cars, but also biofuels, Hydro. biogas, hydrogen in the longer term. So we look at all options and I start from, I re go to what I said in the beginning. We're looking at all options because the challenge is so enormous that you cannot disregard anything. Mm -hmm. Now, having said so, we look very carefully at the possible link between renewable electricity and electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. This is certainly possible. I have to say, it is not a huge change in terms of energy amount. It is a huge change in terms of capacity amount and in organizing the right moment when you are recharging the cars. Right. Let me be more specific. If you think about the model, if you combine PV and the electric cars, well then you have to make sure that your electric car is recharged during the day, mm -hmm. which means probably in your office, not at your home. Mm -hmm. So you need to have the infrastructure in your office and maybe you need also to have some contractual... But this is like you said, uh, this is the complete new infrastructure. It's a complete new thinking but which needs to be thought of. It is not just so simple to think, okay, everything is fine. We have PV on one hand, we have the electric vehicles, we have the batteries, all is solved. It's a little bit more complex than that. Uh, so uh, it is a very interesting field that we are looking carefully. Batteries are still a little bit too expensive, uh, but the uh, intersection of a possible big progress in batteries both for the electric vehicles and the stationary applications in order not to have a 24 hours PV system but to have a PV system that can maybe produce three four hours later mm -hmm. that's a very very interesting topic on which we are working right now. As we are here at EUPVSEC yes. and uh, you told me that you are fun also of uh, solar technology. Sure. I would like to ask you, what do you think? What um, brings you here to EU PVSEC? Hello, I'm trying to remember the first time I was at the EU PVSEC conference, and if I'm not mistaken, it was in 1991. Wow. So this gives you an idea of how fun I am of the <laughs> PV So for me it's only just 12. <laughs> No, for me it's much old. I'm much older than you, and this is, for me it's a, it's, a, it's a much longer time. Mm -hmm. I find this conference to be and to remain a state of the art of the scientific and technology discussion, even today when I can consider myself a little bit expert in PV. I learn a lot every time I hear. Professor Green or people like the lady of IMEC this morning, uh, I, I learn new, new things and I find this an extraordinary conference in terms of state of the art and in, in uh, terms of uh, depicting not only the achievements but also the future. Exactly. There is also like positive emotions, yeah? Absolutely. Uh, this, this conference has always brought to me positive emotions and it continues to do so. And thank you so much for coming since for this very 20, 20, over 20 years to <laughs> UPVSEC. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah. I hope you will yeah, be coming also, also yes. in the future. And maybe next year you will revise slightly also your opinion about solar. I, uh, the, the revision globally, usually I, I don't have a, a big um, issue on that. Uh, solar in, in the coming years is need to is going to improve globally. I am a little bit more concerned about the European picture. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Europe has been the leader over time. It has paid a lot of money and because of that my feeling is that governments and policymakers 
are worried about this uh, cost and also about the impact on other parts of the energy sector, in particular in a situation like in Europe where demand is either flat or growing very, very uh, slowly. Um, every time you push a new technology, something else needs to go out and sometimes this means stranded assets and new costs. I think these concerns are understandable. On but the other hands, hands are in their hands. Actually. Well, on the other hand, we, uh, Europe is a little bit in a paradoxical situation mm -hmm. because we have been paying and we are still paying. Don't forget that feeding tires are f paid for 20 years mm -hmm. for the technology development and we risk to not exploit the benefits if we now uh, pull the brake too much exactly. and we don't have a domestic market. This is the risk I see. This is the challenge that some policy makers, you heard today, Claude uh, Turms mm -hmm. speaking, uh, several people at the Commission and several people in national government, they are fully aware of this situation. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that the Commission and Europe as a whole will come with new solutions and I look forward to the package of legislation which the Commission is preparing to have a better and more optimistic uh, outlook next year. And I suppose that they can also count on the cooperation with the they, agency. They do all the time. We are cooperating at various levels. We are cooperating with the Commission in exchanging opinions, best practices, and sometimes also on, on concrete uh, policy advice. We are collaborating uh, with many European countries, with each domestic government, but also on technologies. As you know, the uh, International Energy Agency has a technology network. Mm -hmm. In the past, this was called the Implementing Agreements. Now it's Technology Collaboration Programs. Mm -hmm. The one of photovoltaics is the PVPS. Mm -hmm. I just was at the very Stefan. high level, exactly, which is uh, chaired by Stefan. Uh, I was just at the side event of the PVPS, a very high level, as always. Mm -hmm. This is the way how we collaborate with many European countries and with many non-member countries because the technology collaboration program is open to non-IA member countries, very important for instance the participation of China. Uh, China will remain for sure the market number one <coughs> for a long time. Uh, the US will which have... Which is actually good news, yes. Which is of course super good news. We would have not solved anything if we did only exactly. PV in Europe and not in China or India. India needs to come with big numbers. The whole South uh, Asia is also important, Latin America, and ultimately we see a case for Africa to make a leapfrog. Africa could be a continent whose economic development is really entirely driven by affordable renewables. Exactly. So thank you so much once Thanks again, Paolo. Grazie mille. Prego, and we'll meet next year at EUPVSEC. Absolutely. Thank you so, so much. Is already for now. Thank you very much.